Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we are just waiting for everybody to come in, so please bear with us. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, one and all. Thanks for joining us. We're just waiting for everybody else to come in, and when everyone's in, we will get going. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Right. I think I think we're there. We will get going. Um, right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Barney. Uh, I work for the operations team at Nature Trek. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us on this chilly evening. Um, so we have four wonderful speakers for you this evening uh, to talk about about uh, the wildlife in the UK. Uh, starting off, we have Tom talking about UK marine mammals, uh, followed by Sue uh, talking about a couple of our go slow trips in this country. Uh, we'll have a break and then uh, we will have Matt, uh, also from the Nature Trek operations team, uh, talking about Somerset and Cornwall, and finally finishing up with Neil, uh, who will be talking about the Ar Arnhemurkin Peninsula uh, up in Scotland. Um, so just before we get going, um, you might wonder why we're we doing uh, presentations about the UK. The world has opened back up again. Uh, but it might surprise you to know that actually uh, the UK has always been one of our most popular destinations. Before the pandemic, if we were asked where's the most popular place, um, it's a toss up between Spain and the UK. Um, obviously, the pandemic happened um, and in the intervening years, um, opening up, lockdown opening up, obviously we could only do the UK. We've done day trips. Uh, we've done more tours within this country uh, than ever before. Um, last year, absolutely, the UK uh, was our most popular place and it's looking to be the same for this year as well um there's so much to see in this country so much um and uh today we hope to give you a small small snapshot of that um there's so much in fact that we're going to be doing uh, another talk on the uk in a few weeks time but anyway without further ado i shall hand over to tom um the floor is yours Thank you, Barney, and good evening, everybody. OK, so I'm going to talk about the marine mammals of the UK. And actually, this photograph was taken about 10 minutes from my house about 30 years ago, more of which a bit later on. OK, just a bit of background on me. I've been involved in a, a charity marine life for uh, 27 years now which uh, monitors whales and dolphins and seabirds around the coast of the UK and uh, I've been the research director for the charity since 2005 and you can see there we've put a, got pretty good coverage of southern Britain all those green lines there are the surveys we've made in uh, UK waters OK, so in the UK, then we have uh, 28 species have been recorded, uh, which is uh, over a quarter of the world's uh, species of whales and dolphins. And but only about 15 of those occur each year. And if you look at this map of, of the UK, you can see there's a red line around the coast. That's the 12 nautical mile limit. And then beyond that, we've got the economic zone of the UK which stretches out into much deeper waters so the the animals highlighted in red on the left are the ones that you could see in in uh, inshore 12 nautical mile waters but the bluer ones you have to go much further offshore and so species for example like the Sowerby's beaked whale and the northern bottlenose whale and the white-sided dolphin do occur in pretty decent numbers in UK waters, but unless you get well offshore, off northwest Scotland, you're almost uh, 
high, it's highly unlikely that you're going to see those animals. Same for things like sperm whales and uh, and sort of humpbacks and fin whales. They're more associated with the deeper waters of the northern Bay of Biscay, which you can see on the on the map there. There's that wedge of land, uh, we, sorry, wedge of uh, the economic zone that just goes out to the edge of the slope of the continental shelf. So, Nate, yeah, also we're talking about sea mammals on this uh, uh, evening. So uh, that includes two species of seal, the harbour seal on the left there, grey seal in the middle, and otters as well, which uh, don't really go offshore, but you do get them in coastal areas feeding. So Nature Trek have two dedicated wildlife cruises around in the British Isles and uh, on those trips, you stand a pretty good chance of seeing seven species of whale and dolphin, as well as uh, seals and otters. So the first of those is a fantastic, looks like a fantastic trip. It's, uh, I should point out, I haven't done any of these UK cru cruisers myself, uh, so, uh, but, but they do look, uh, I've been to a lot of those islands that are highlighted on these tours and uh, so here's the first one so perhaps the the real standout there is a trip to St Kilda in the middle of the nine day trip but it goes to a lot of other amazing uh, islands as well very beautiful area and it's on this sort of small ship the Seahorse 2 which uh, hosts 11 guests so yeah, as I say, a nine day trip. And this uh, just shows you a, a couple of tables of sightings from last year, one in May and another one in July. So the May trip had some really good encounters of minke whale with uh, seen on three days. And there's a pod of killer whale seen, a pod of orcas, a really big super pod of common dolphins, and then porpoises most days, as well as otters and, and good numbers of seals every day. So, you know, a really fantastic trip. The July one was was different again because uh, there's quite a few sightings of white bee dolphin on that one, seen on three dates. Not, a, not an easy animal to connect with in UK waters. Most of them are a bit, they are, they are on the continental shelf but they are further offshore because they don't tend to co-occur with bottlenose dolphins. So wherever you get a bottlenose, you don't tend to get white beaks. But yeah, you know, really good trip, good mix of sightings. And you can see from this uh, screen grab, it's a fantastic trip for a whole range of wildlife, as well as the stunning uh, Scottish island scenery. So, you know, white-tailed eagles, breeding skewers, cliff nesting seabirds in, in large quantities and, uh, you know, lots of other seabirds like fulmers as well. So if you want to go on that uh, tour, uh, unfortunately it's already booked for, for this year, but there are some four dates for next year. So there's usually four trips per annum for this nine day tour. And so speak to uh, Alistair in the office about that. OK, the next one is another Scottish wildlife cruise. And this one, uh, the other one goes from Oban. This one goes from Ullapool, actually. It's a slightly shorter trip lasting seven days on this comfy vessel that harbors eight guests i'm going to try and pronounce this but i might be wrong the mv monolith perhaps hopefully maybe somebody will correct me at uh, question time but again another really interesting itinerary passing through the minch sea which is a stronghold for white beak dolphin and then uh, visiting uh, you know sky as well as uh, as well as the Isle of Lewis. Just got one trip report from last year for that tour, but it does highlight that it's an excellent trip. Good numbers of common dolphins every day, same for Harbour Porpoise. 
uh, white beak dolphin seen on one of the days and then several encounters of minky well including uh, over 10 on one of the days which must have been quite a fantastic spectacle once again uh, good numbers of seals most days and looking at the pictures in the brochure it looks uh, like you're going to see some amazing other wildlife as well lots of seabirds puffins and black guillemots and then divers as well black-throated and red-throated divers as well as the as I say, the beautiful island scenery and all the flowers and land birds too. So once again, Alison looks after this tour and there's a couple of, what, couple of trips coming up, one in each year, both in July. So once again, speak to uh, Alison in the, in the office if you're interested in uh, doing one of those trips. Okay, but my, my involvement in Nature Trek and marine animals in a UK context is to do these day trips in and around Lime Bay that have been running since 2009, actually. And, <coughs> excuse me, Lime Bay is a very rich area for whales and dolphins. Just over the last five years, uh, five, <coughs> excuse me, 10 species have been seen. And... Uh, this is the whale that was on the very first slide and you can see there if, you, if you're familiar with the Dorset coastline you've got the golden cap in the background and it was a humpback scene present for over a week at the, back in 1992. So we've got a couple of options that we utilize. Uh, the first day trip runs out of Brixham and that's on this very comfy boat the spot on. The real standout feature of this boat, well, there's a couple of standout features. One is you can get onto the bow, so you can see the dolphins bow riding. But the other thing is there's a flybridge above the wheelhouse, which enables me and, uh, and others to, to get some extra height to try and spot the dolphins from, uh, from, the, from the greater visibility that that brings. Uh, I've got a really good skipper there, Ross Parham, who's... Uh, he, he, he's, his eyes are like 10 by 50 he spots dolphins you know that I can barely see through the binoculars he's just a fantastic observer which helps so well we mix up the the trips in terms of where we go we usually do about 80 miles so it's a long day we're, we're out by about eight o'clock come back about sort of five-ish and uh, we cover a lot of sea ground and where we go depends on on the weather conditions, the sea surface temperature, whether if we can see any gradients in uh, sea temperature, they're often good, good productive areas. But also we look for where the fishing vessels are as well, and because that would give us an indication of where the prey items are, which dolphins and whales might be feeding on. But but we'll we'll usually go to this area east of uh, Brixham into the western middle part of Lime Bay. And that's because if you look at this uh, map here of survey effort, you can see that the red dots of this rarer dolphin, the white beak dolphin are concentrated in that area. So we always try and check that area out because that has been in previous years, the standout species on this trip. And we know that they are concentrated in that area because there's a lot of red uh, sort of purple colored track lines where we haven't seen that dolphin. So it's a real anom anomaly, this uh, white beak dolphin, as you can see from this distribution map on the right, where the red dots represent occurrence. So it's not really meant to occur in the channel. And this, so this is a fairly isolated population, the, probably the most southerly in the world. And uh, I actually discovered these dolphins uh, back in 2007. I thought it was a real one-off fluke, but we've managed to see them or others have seen them every year since. And uh, through mark recapture analysis, we think that it's been up to about 150 animals there. This is one of the sightings from a nature trip trip a few years ago 
So the animals, uh, if they are round, will come to bow ride around the ship. Just a bit on the ecology, you know, why is this cold water dolphin that has a northern distribution in Lime Bay? Uh, that's because uh, it's essentially very similar habitat to central northern North Sea. The orange and yellow there are sandy seabed habitat, which the dolphin seems to be associated with. Also, there's a lot of First and Second World War wrecks in there where the a sort of cod, haddock and whiting, the white fish that they eat, find a sanctuary there and occur in large numbers. But the other thing is that although the water temperature seems too warm, the water is actually stratified in the summer. And, the, and though, so although it's warm on the top, it's actually cold underneath where these dolphins feed. And so in a, the, this stratification in the water, this temperature gradient allows a cold water dolphin to live in a, a relatively warm environment. Yeah, white beak can't be guaranteed anymore, unfortunately. It's probably declined with, with as sea temperatures have rises. They are still around, but they're quite elusive now, so we don't see them on every trip. But we always see good numbers of common dolphins and if the weather's smooth, porpoises as well. And usually see most years minky whale as well. This is one taken in the middle of Lime Bay a few years ago amongst a sort of feeding frenzy of there's hundreds of gannets and shearwaters there. It's quite a spectacle. If you ever see David Mills, uh, Nature Trek's managing director, book on a trip, go with him. He's incredibly lucky on on these Lime Bay trips. He's absolutely cleaned up the couple of times he's been out there. This is David there uh, watching a basking shark. But probably my best ever photograph from Lam Lime Bay was a really lucky encounter with a 350 pound thresher shark, which jumped out several times. Unfortunately, I had my camera in the wheelhouse, so I had to run in there, come back out. I only took two shots of it, but this was one of them. So uh, really lucky. I put this out on Twitter and there was a bidding war with the tabloids to, to buy this photograph. And uh, yeah, it, it, it sort of went all around the world, got sort of uh, 30,000 hits on the Lad Bible and various other things. So Lime Bay is a very good place for threshers, particularly in June and July. The other thing you'll see on this trip is usually and increasing numbers of this globally and critically endangered Balearic shearwater. And this tr trip and the Weymouth one, they're probably the, some of the best places in the world to get views of this Europe's rarest seabird. OK, the second trip is from Weymouth. It, and this is, uh, well, the boat we have used in the past is called Snapper, but it's just changed now to the Katrina. But it's a similar, similar comfy vessel with forward viewing and a very able skipper, Luke Pettis. And uh, so we leave from Weymouth. It's another full day trip. Uh, and we've got quite a few options there. We can go east along the beautiful Jurassic coastline. But we usually uh, sail past uh, Portland, the Isle of Portland, around the bill, and then head out west into Lime Bay and do a bit of a loop. But again, we work with the weather, with the uh, sea surface temperature, plankton conditions, and where the fishing vessels are. This trip gets off to a good start because uh, for the last three years, there's been a resident pair of bottlenose dolphins. And this is probably the most reliable place in the UK for this dolphin. So, uh, the, you know, you can almost get, I've never not seen them put it that way. And I've done about 30 trips the last uh, three years. And uh, so there they are. The locals name them Harry and Wills. It's probably a bit inappropriate now. They're not really the best of friends, are they? But uh, they were associated with the cruise ships when the pandemic was on. But now they've moved, settled into Portland Harbour. Now those cruise ships are back in business. 
and get some incredible views. Here's one uh, eating a conger eel. And I, I've posted quite a lot of pictures of these dolphins on Twitter, but I tend to uh, go for the spectacular shots. But in 2021, uh, Les Mears on a nature trek trip with me took a fairly routine fin shot you know, something like this. And uh, a, a whaling dolphin expert who works for whaling dolphin conservation, Charlie Phillips, said, I recognise these two. And we found out the true identity of Harry and Wills. Uh, it's actually a mother and calf pair, not a pair of brothers. And uh, the mother on the left there was born in 2009, the calf in 2016. And they lived in the Moray Firth, over the whole period, but then suddenly vanished in 2018, appeared in Weymouth in 2019. And but it took another, you know, two years or so before people realized uh, where, where what they were, what they were. And actually, that's the first movement documented of dolphins between the Moray Firth and the Channel. OK. Uh, just a couple of other things on the trip. The Shambles Bank is uh, one of the best places in the UK to see Paul Beagle sharks in June and July around the, the race where you get this choppy water and a lot of marine activity. It's a good place to see bigger pods of bottlenose dolphins as well as commons pictured here and harbour porpoises in the Portland Deep. And you get these uh, major feeding frenzies of gulls and sometimes shearwaters and terns on the flood tide really is quite a spectacle and but the birds just come in like this and then once the tide changes they're gone as we met move further offshore into line bay we get common dolphins usually and plenty of seabirds balearics again and things like storm petrels both of these trips in Lime Bay have cliff nesting seabirds and grey seals. So there are two other additions. And on the Weymouth trip, it's the nearest place to London where you can see breeding puffins. Uh, we, we head over towards Swanage and Dancing Ledge where there's a few pairs uh, still nesting. So if you want to go on one of those trips uh, for Weymouth, contact Dan in, uh, sorry, Matt in the office who's... Uh, here with us tonight we've got three dates lined up this year so far and uh, and in the office for the bricks and trips where we've got five uh, trips lined up okay i think i'm out of time now so uh thanks for your attention i'm going to uh stop sharing the screen and uh, look forward to listening to the others Thanks very much for that, Tom. Fantastic stuff. Uh, right, Sue, over to you. Okay, just let me share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Okay, well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Tom, and thank you, Barney. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about two of our go slow uh, holidays. Uh, first of all, one in East Anglia, uh, which is running between June the 26th and July the 2nd this year. And then I'm going to tell you about uh, our go slow in Dorset trip, uh, which is June the 19th to June the 25th. So it is actually possible to do these um, back to back if, if you want to. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've actually been leading Nature Trek trips now for 21 years. I started in 2002. Uh, I've led over uh, about 30 um, full holidays, mostly in Europe, uh, botany and, and general natural history ones. And the picture on the left is me up a mountain in Switzerland on my very first uh, Nature Trek trip. And uh, 
the one on the right is actually from last year and that's from uh, the Dorset trip, which I'm going to tell you about. Uh, birds are my first love. I worked for the British Trust for Ornithology for 26 years, um, but I did train as a botanist and, and basically I love all wildlife, um, history, geology, you name it. Um, any, anything that moves or, or grows, I love. Butterflies, dragonflies. Um, but I do have to admit to a particular fondness for wild bees. So do be on the lookout for wild bees in this talk. So what do we mean by the go slow holidays? If, if any of you have not been on one or, or know about them, they're very relaxed, as the name suggests. We use high quality hotels and serving superfood. And I can certainly attest to the fact that both the hotels on these trips do serve amazing food. The excursions themselves are leisurely. We don't go out early in the morning. Um, the, the, the morning and evening outings are entirely optional. During the day, we'll stop for coffee breaks, comfort breaks, and as well as the sort of famous generous picnic lunches, um, we will also a couple of days during the week um, have lunch out. We'll just spend more time looking at what we're finding, thinking about what we're finding. And we return to the hotel mid afternoon, which gives you plenty of time for relaxation and also time to enjoy anything else you might wish to do. So first of all, as I said, I'm going to tell you about the, the East Anglian one. It's actually the second one that's running, but uh, this is a new trip this year. And uh, I noticed on the website it's down as Go Slow in Brex and Fens. So when most people think about wildlife in East Anglia, they possibly think about the North Norfolk coast, the Norfolk broads, somewhere like that, usually on the coastal area. But this trip is going to be concentrating very much on Breckland. Um, it is an, an ancient area, um, a very mysterious area, and it's characterised by twisted pines, sandy, dry soils and amazing wide, wide skies. And it is also home to some quite incredible wildlife. And I feel it's one of those areas that perhaps needs to be better known. We will be based in a hotel um, on the south side of the Brex near Bury St Edmunds. It is a modern hotel. Um, it's a very, very nice one. It has a two AA rosette uh, restaurant and uh, it has lots of facilities for you to enjoy. Um, the swimming pool, the sauna um, and all of that and the gym are all available for us to use as part of our, our package. It is also a golfing hotel. So if anybody does fancy a round of golf during the week, they're, they're, they're welcome to do that. And if you really want to uh, spoil yourself, there's also a spa on site. But we will have to pull ourselves away from the hotel and go out and explore. And Breckland is a very unusual area. Very, it is very dry, very sandy. Um, and it's probably closest to somewhere like the Russian steppes you would have to, to go to find um, the nearest similar habitats. The Brex covers an area of about 370 uh, square miles across the Norfolk Suffolk borders. And uh, some of the wildlife that we'll find will be things like the rabbits, which obviously keep the uh, turf very short, but also woodlarks here. Um, the amazing Lulula, their songs, and strange Breckland plants like here, the Spanish catfly. We'll visit Cavernham Heath, which is the, the absolute archetypal, if you like, uh, Breckland Heath, um, where the dominant ground vegetation is actually a lichen. It's a very odd place. And there we will hopefully catch up with one of the key Breckland species, which is, of course, stone curlew. And here's one of my bees. It's a coastal species that's found in land in, in the Brex. And it has the most fantastic pantaloons here. And it is obviously called the pantaloon bee. You cannot escape Thetford Forest itself. It's uh, 47,000 acres of plantation, mostly planted in the 1920s. Um, and you generally think of it as a pine monoculture, but that is actually far from the truth. There are lots of areas of other kinds of woodland in Thetford Forest, and it's an area that we will be crisscrossing um, as we visit other sites, but we will also be looking at some of the um, particular wildlife to be found in Thetford Forest. Uh, we have a very large herd 
of wild red deer. They're not just found in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, crossbill is a, is a very characteristic species of uh, Thetford Forest. Siskin breed here as well. We'll spend a bit of time looking at flowers and vipers bug gloss seems to be a real uh, characteristic species around here and it is fantastic for insects and in the rivers that run through Thetford Forest is well known for its population of otters so that it's always an, uh, a, a chance. I've sort of given the impression that Breckland is a very dry area and whilst that's true there are areas of water and where they occur they are absolutely incredible for wildlife. One of the places we'll visit is Thompson Common, where you will learn about the weirdly named pingos, which each of these little blue pools here is. And Thompson Common is really good for invertebrates in particular. And uh, one of the key species there is the scarce emerald damselfly, which is the top one uh, on the screen. And uh, we'll be able to hopefully compare it directly with its much more common, uh, common emerald. We'll visit Lake and Heath Fen, which is just on the western side of the Breck, so literally on the Breck Fen edge. Um, and RSPB Lake and Heath Fen is a very well-known reserve, a fairly new reserve. And hopefully we will encounter some of the special species there with crane being the big pull. There are marsh harriers and bittern as well, but also good numbers of cuckoo, things like sedge warbler and maybe even grasshopper warbler um, and other interesting species. Lackford Lakes, which is a man-made wetland, uh, is another place that we will visit. And again, lots of potential fantastic wildlife to be found. Uh, we've got common snipe here and water rail is always a, a good species there. There's some fantastic opportunities for taking pictures of kingfishers and always the possibility of our special Norfolk hawker dragonfly. There's time for relaxation and we're very near the nearby town of Bury St Edmunds, uh, where the cathedral, which you can see the tower of um, here, was once just the gate guard to the massive uh, abbey, which is now in ruins. But even in the abbey grounds, we can find wildlife like the, the Breckland Hoary Mullion here. And on another day, we'll be visiting the Suffolk Valley uh, Fens, which is one of the ones that I do a one day um, trip for. Uh, and orchids will be our main focus at that time of year. And they are an absolutely incredible area to visit. There's lots of other wildlife as well. Uh, we have pretty good chance of seeing common lizard and we've got a little baby here in the centre of the screen. But if you look up at the top, you'll actually see his mum. The main draw of this uh, Suffolk Valley Fens, I mentioned, is the orchids and there are some incredibly rare ones. And the, the tip top one, if you like, is this little chap, which doesn't have an English name, although the locals do tend to call it the ice cream orchid. And it's Dactyloriza ocreluca, which up until very recently was only known from the one site that we will be visiting. But the other one, and if you're scared of spiders, you might not like the next slide. The other star species is our fen raft spider, and they are actually quite cute, but they're also very large. They do eat fish, but not, as the locals will tell you, uh, small children and uh, passing dogs and cats. They're not quite that big. I mentioned the wide skies and as a sort of finishing uh, slide for this one, OK, taken in the winter, but this was um, outside our back window here just a couple of days ago. The skies around Breckland are quite incredible. So that's a, a whistle stop tour of, of the Go, Go Slow in East Anglia new trip. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Go Slow in Dorset. Mm -hmm says so running uh, from the 19th of June to the 25th of June. This will be its third year. I've led the previous two years as well. It's in, in the area that I actually was born and, and grew up in, so I do know it uh, very well. The area that we will be concentrating on mostly is this sort of area on the south, the Isle of Purbeck, the famous Jurassic Coast, and also the area around Weymouth and uh, Port and Bill uh, that was mentioned in the previous um, talk. So Heath's amazing scenery, chalk cliffs, 
wildlife and also obviously in the company of dinosaurs, you never know, we might be lucky. We stay in the beautiful Purbeck village of Corfe Castle and the hotel we stay in is Morstons Manor, which is a grade two Elizabethan um, hotel. It's perfectly placed um, to explore all these wonderful sites. And the afternoon that we get there, we will start off by going out and sort of having a, a, an overview of the Isle of Purbeck and Poole Harbour. And we'll spend a very short period of time just having a quick look, getting a feel for some of the wildlife of the area, going down into the wet flushes where we'll see um, some of the key species. There's lots of insectivorous species. We have butterwort and sundew is here and like little um, Christmas lights, like little fairy lights dotted through uh, at that time of year, the bog ashfordel will be in flower. And I actually took the picture of the plant before I realised there was a small um, butterfly photobombing this. And that is actually a silver studded blue, which is one of our target species um, for the week. We will, of course, be visiting the Jurassic Coast. And this is the quite incredible uh, Lulworth Cove. And you will have an opportunity to go to the visitor centre there if you wish to find out more about the geology of the site. But we'll also be just enjoying um, the scenery and the wildlife. We'll walk, and it's a very gentle walk, to the nearby stair hole, which is a new cove uh, forming. And again, we'll, we'll enjoy some of the wildlife to be found there. The beautiful sea carrot, it's, it's really furry sea carrot. It has to be seen to be believed. And we are usually pretty lucky with silver wash fertility here at Lulworth. And also there's bound to be um, ravens flying around, cronking um, as we enjoy the, the site. And then we'll move across to the iconic Durdle Door. It is a beautiful walk, um, just, a, just a stunning area. And we're looking out across here. You can just see in the distance there, Portland, um, the Isle of Portland on the horizon. And again, lots of wildlife to be found here. It's a really good site for white throats, which we should hear singing in the scrub. Um, there's lots of marbled whites here as well. And this one, I've put, a, I've put an exclamation mark because when I put the photo up, it's one I took a few years ago, I noticed that this poor marbled white butterfly has just been got by a small white crab spider um, on that flower. And uh, this is a very good site for corn bunting as well, where, where we'll hear their sort of jangling keys song and hopefully get good views of them too. But the star um, at this site at Durdle Door and around Lulworth Cove is another butterfly. It is the Lulworth skipper, which is an incredibly range restricted uh, species in Britain. But there are generally good numbers there. And I'm hoping this will work for you um, just to give you an idea of what it's like. And this is actually Vipers Bugloss that I mentioned in the East Anglian uh, tour as well. Lots of uh, Lulworth skippers there. One of our optional trips will be a slightly early morning one, not, not silly o'clock at all, but we go out with the amphibian and reptile conservation um, and have a look for uh, reptiles. And in fact, I have to tell you that, that uh, this past year, we did actually manage to find all six native British reptiles during this week and during this particular walk out with the chap from um, ARC we came across a basking smooth snake in this case a lovely female smooth snake I um, don't know if you can just see her little nose poking out here and under license um, we were able to examine her a little bit more closely absolutely gorgeous animal we did find a second uh, smooth snake under one of the, the tins, as well as um, common lizard, slow worm, and in fact, weirdly, grass snake here. Um, but say so we've got a chance of finding all of the native reptiles. And there's other wildlife here as well, of course, and, and hobby. Uh, we had fantastic views of hobby hunting just over our heads. <clears throat> and then you can't go to this area without heading out into Pool Harbour itself. And this is the ferry across to Brown Sea Island and we will spend a day there. And again, there's lots of fantastic things to see. It's 
it's a beautiful island. There's a large part of it is um, run by the National Trust, but there is also a small part that is dedicated uh, to the Dorset Wildlife Trust, and we'll certainly explore that. It's got large seabird colonies and um, things like that. We we're also very lucky last year to find sand lizard here, um, which is surprising because it hasn't long been known on Brown Sea Island. But one of the draws here are the tern colonies, and lots and lots of sandwich terns with their very distinctive little yellow tips to their beaks here and just to give you an idea of what the <clears throat> excuse me what the tern colonies are like there's just islands um, covered in common terns and uh, sandwich terns there's also large numbers of black-headed gulls breeding here with their really really beautiful young and you quite often see spoonbills here as well but of course, one of the main draws for Brown Sea Island is red squirrel. And we've been very lucky um, on both trips uh, to get incredibly close views of these wonderful little animals. Another day we will explore Dulston Country Park, which is actually on the Isle of Purbeck. There's a really, really interesting visitor centre there and a restaurant where we will have lunch. And we'll do a gentle cliff top walk um, along the edge uh, at Durlston, where we'll see lots of interesting plants like those fantastic sea carrots again, and ivory broom rape is a particularly um, good uh, find here. And we might even be lucky, as we were last year, to find the seventh species of British reptile, a non native one, because there is a colony of wall lizards here. But the main draw of Durlston is that uh, seabird cliff. And at this time of year, we, we should be seeing certainly guillemots and razorbills uh, with young. There's almost invariably peregrine around, there's fulmar nesting there, and there's also shag. So we get good views of all these birds, which are just great to see. And because Dulston is just on the outskirts of uh, Studland, um, of Swanage, sorry, uh, you then have the opportunity to come back to the hotel uh, by steam train should you wish to and everybody so far has chosen to do that and the will either come round to the station to pick you up at Corfe or you can literally just go through the gate because it's just behind the hotel and a lot of people then take the opportunity to go and visit Corfe Castle um, itself as well. We have one optional evening trip um, and that will be to see and hear Nightjar You can just see him sitting on the branch there and churring. We actually got, um, I meant to say, we also have a night jar evening uh, and the go slow in East Anglia one as well. And on two of the days, we will head towards the west down towards Weymouth and, and Portland and in an area where even the A roads um, have drifts of orchids. These sort of purple smears on this photograph here are pyramidal orchids. And this is right by the side of the A road that runs down to Weymouth. There's several great reserves to visit um, down here, which is why we're sort of heading this way. And the first is the fabulous urban reserve of Radipole, which used to be my stomping ground when I was a kid. And we've got a really good chance of seeing things like bearded tit here, uh, great white egret um, and Chetty's warbler. But also there's a large number of marsh harriers there. So you get this bizarre juxtaposition of marsh harriers against uh, buildings in the background. We'll also visit nearby Lodmore Reserve, where there's a large colony of uh, common terns. And we will amble our way down towards Portland Bill itself. It's just an incredible place to go. It's very, very unusual feel about it, Portland. And there are some really nice uh, pieces of wildlife to be seen. This is golden samphire growing below uh, Portland Bill Lighthouse, uh, quite a rare plant, very range restricted. And we'll have a very short walk around the bill and there's lots of other wildlife to be seen, some of which gets really close. Um, here we were, in the process of being mugged by a rock pipit. On the way back through, we'll stop up at the Portland Heights and look back inland 
along Chesil Beach. And as we sort of head into the photograph and round to the left, we're heading west uh, towards Devon as we're looking here. And even here, there's there's wildlife, and this one's perhaps a little bit of a, a, a challenge for you. Um, we found a butterfly here. There is a grayling butterfly in this photograph. And just in case it's a little too well camouflaged, there he is. And then the last morning, we'll go back down onto Studland Heath to get really get a feel for the amazing wildlife down there. Some of the things that we haven't had a chance to see were definitely come across seeker deer, which are very common in the area. Lots of dragonflies, and we've got some unusual ones here. We've got scarce chaser on the left. Uh, black darter, female black darter in the middle, and a keeled skimmer on the right. Quite often find emperor moth caterpillars, and I did warn you about the bees. And this one is actually my favourite bee of all, which is the green-eyed bee, which is very common on Studland. And then we will, of course, during all of this, hope to come across the star species, which is our Dartford warbler, which is hopefully pretty much a done deal on Studland Heath. And that's everything from me. And I'm just hoping that um, I will get to meet some of you in person on either or possibly even both of those tours. I'd love that very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Sue. Right, Matt, I shall uh, I shall hand over to you. There we go. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. I've unmuted myself. And great. Very good evening, everyone. My name is Matt and I work in the operations team here at Nature Trek HQ. I currently manage a number of tours ranging from North America and down to Southeast Asia. But for tonight, I'm going to talk to you about Somerset and Cornwall. And I'll start off with Somerset. So Somerset is one of our most popular UK tours. It's only a three day tour and we run it in the winter but also in late spring and early summer as well. But for the purpose of this evening, I'm just going to concentrate on our winter tour, as that is very popular indeed. OK, so we base our tours um, in the centre of the cultural and small city of Wells, um, and the hotel is situated directly opposite uh, Wells Cathedral, as you can see from this bedroom. Um, if you do want this bedroom, you may have to pay a wee bit extra, but um, it is with a, a fine view. But the hotel is very adequate. Uh, they're very used to nature to nature track groups we've been going there for a number of years and um, so they're very much used to what we want and what our clients want so it's a wonderful base for us and all our sites are roughly around a 45 minute drive away maximum uh, some are only 20 minutes away so there's not too much driving on this tour as well so this is just a flavor of what one of the hotel looks like and the Sorry, how this tour works. So it's a three day tour and the tour doesn't officially start um, until the first evening. So if you wish to arrive around mid afternoon, uh, that gives you time to wander around the city and also visit the cathedral as well. And this is Wells Cathedral in its finest. Um, and it really is a spectacular structure and a wonderful addition uh, to this tour. But our main concentration is, of course, on the Somerset levels. Um, so we spend two whole days circumnavigating all the various minor roads which circumnavigate the entire area, an area, in fact, of around 160,000 acres. Uh, so there's quite a lot to work on, but thankfully the local guides we use, uh, they're very familiar with the area. Um, so you're in very good hands indeed. So for our two full days after our general in introduction on the first evening is that we head to around 45 minutes away to um, a small woodland. Um, oh sorry, firstly, before I go on to that, I'm, I'm bushing ahead of myself this evening. Um, so 
So our tours are very easy going in Somerset. So we visit a number of nature reserves. So there's plenty of uh, bird watching hides to go into. Uh, so plenty of relaxation and a number of pathways as well are either along boardwalks such as this one or on well-maintained pathways. Um, so you don't have to have a high level of fitness at all. Um, it's all generally very flat apart from the small woodland, which I'm just about to introduce you to. So it's all very nice and easy, nice and calm and excellent excellent, excellent birding indeed. And in fact, it's one of my favourite areas in the UK and I'm very well travelled um, in the UK, and, but Somerset is very special indeed. So our first morning, so we head around 45 minutes away from the hotel um, and we head down to the south end of the Somerset levels uh, to a, a small woodland um, to get a very good flavour, a nice introduction to the bird watching in the area of the woodland birds. But it also gives a fantastic viewpoint over the southern end of the Somerset levels. And here is a really good opportunity to catch up with one of our main target birds, and that is the common crane. Now numbers here are still rather low, but you can get flocks of up to 30 or 40, um, especially um, if we go to their roost. Um, we don't tend to do it on the Sunset Levels free day tour, only because we concentrate our efforts um, at the Starling Roost, uh, which of course I will touch on to later. Uh, so that's why we visit here in the morning uh, to try and get our view of the common crane, a beautiful species. And the later on in the winter you leave it, the better chance you have of seeing and dancing on the levels and it is a fantastic sight. Um, as you can see from this individual, um, it is ringed. Uh, this is part of the reintroduction scheme of common cranes on the Somerset levels, uh, but there, there are a fair few which aren't ringed as well. Um, so you do have the opportunity, the opportunity to not see them with any fancy footwear. Okay, so some of the species we do see in the woods, um, for example, great spotted woodpecker, um, nice and easy in the woodlands. Um, we do visit a feeding station as well. So that brings in birds such as the nuthatch, uh, but this wood is um, exceptional in the spring or winter. In the winter, um, of course, great chance of seeing the UK's smallest member of bird, the gold crest. Um, it's also excellent for a tree creeper as well. Um, and in the spring, if we were to come here in the spring, which we do on our Somerset Levels in spring tour, uh, breeding spotted flycatchers are here. And there's also a, a heronry as well, um, which is rather raucous um, in the early breeding season. So this is a fantastic introduction to our tours in the Somerset levels, but we do go on to concentrate our main efforts um, on the levels themselves. I'm just going to keep this slide up for um, a wee few seconds uh, to see if you can spot the four species of duck which are in this photo. So in the winter, um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of ducks um, are on the levels and an intermixed on very rare occasions is the odd rare bird. Last year, some of our groups were very lucky uh, to see a Drake by Caltil. Um, and our tour, which has just returned from the levels um, at the weekend, saw an American widgeon and a lesser scorp as well. So if you have looked through this photo, there are four species. That's teal, widgeon, uh, we have a gadwall here, and then a couple of shoveler as well. Well done if you got all those. And we do also visit a number of uh, sites which yield fantastic views of some very cryptic species, which are very hard to see well in the UK. And of course, one is the uh, common snipe. Uh, views such as this are very achievable um, on this tour. Now, great white egrets, this is somewhat of a success story on the Somerset levels. Um, in 2012, the first breeding pair was noted on the levels, and that was the first breeding pair in the UK. Now, or in 2020, 50 fledglings um, were found, which is absolutely incredible, and just goes to show what a productive area this is for herons, and it really, really is, especially in the winter months. So the cattle egret, um, 
their numbers have skyrocketed in the past few years on the levels. Uh, last year when I was down there, this wasn't part of a Nature Trek tour, but it was in between um, tours. I counted a single flock of 220 cattle egrets, which is just bonkers, really. If, if you were to go back 10 years, you probably wouldn't have seen a cattle egret in Somerset. Um, so again, another success story and maybe a bit of global warming in there as well. So this view here, we've got Glastonbury tour in the background, but this is just to show you the navigation pathways, et cetera, of reed beds, which attracts um, obviously one of the most cryptic herons uh, that we have here in the UK. Now, if you just look along the left-hand channel here, um, it's okay, there's no bird there, so you don't have to go searching for a bird. Uh, but if you look out on the left, just around here, hopefully you can see my cursor. They, these are more small channels heading inland. Um, and this, these are the perfect feeding areas for the bittern, uh, which again, do very well on the Somerset levels. Um, a species which was an extinct breeder here in the UK not too long ago. Um, now on the levels themselves, so just within the 160,000 acres of the Avalon marshes, there are around now 45 breeding pairs, which is absolutely remarkable. Uh, so if you on one of our tours, you do stand a good chance, not a guaranteed chance, but a good chance of uh, seeing a bittern. And our tour, which just came back at the weekend, they had a very nice flight view um, of a bittern. So fantastic news for them. Bearded tits also do very well on the levels and you can get views such as this one. Uh, last winter was exceptionally good for this species on the levels. Uh, this winter, not so much, but they do move around a lot. Uh, so you do definitely have to be in the right place at the right time. But obtaining views such as this is not an impossibility at all. However, when one comes to the Somerset levels in the winter, you have to see a starling and preferably more than one or a dozen, um, roughly around 500,000 to 1.5 million starlings. Uh, very much depends on the winter. This winter has been exceptional for the starling memorations, mainly because of the cold weather we have had. Now, it really is a spectacular sight, and I cannot emphasize it enough that it is truly one of the natural wonders, not in not just here in the UK, but in Europe and potentially even the world as well. The Somerset levels has the greatest number um, of, of starlings um, in the UK, which creates a mass murmuration, especially if the birds of prey are also knocking about. But I'll touch on that in a bit. So please just imagine yourself for the time being along a, a pathway with, with dusk not too far away, marsh areas swirling around you. And then all of a sudden on a distant hillside, there's a dark cloud forming towards you. And that cloud just goes on and on and on. And 10, 15 minutes later, there's roughly 500,000 starlings swirling around you or above you, um, ready to go and roost in the reed bed. Now it's not until the birds of prey arrive that these murmurations are formed. So the starlings, their main goal is to get within the reed bed. They do not want to be swirling around and displaying for everyone gawping up at them. They want to get into the reed beds, but it's the birds of prey which are around which cause these murmurations. So species like the Merlin, um, that's, it's not, um, it's not seen on every trip. Uh, they are quite difficult on the levels, but um, a very good chance they will happily take a starling. Uh, but marsh areas, these are the main cause for the murmurations and they won't tackle them midair. They will wait until the starlings have settled in the reeds themselves before trying to pluck one out. Uh, so the starlings have gone down and if a marsh area goes over, the starlings swirl back up again, creating mass complication and um, it's just absolutely fantastic and the noise associated with the whirring and everything is um, just amazing and hen harrier as well um, these are seen on most of our tours and um, especially um, around the starling memoration because them too will take a, a starling out of the rebed but they can be seen elsewhere as well and there's usually a good wintering population on the levels Okay, I'll just uh, nip back, sorry. So if that hasn't enticed you enough, then um, 
I'm sorry, but um, um, it really is a fantastic trip. And we do have spaces on our Sunset Levels tour on the 22nd of February. Uh, so it's a free day tour. If you have some free time, it's well worth getting down there because as I said, the starling murmurations this winter have been fantastic. Okay, that is Somerset. That's a whistle stop tour. Uh, we're now going to head down to Cornwall. So this is a relatively new tour post pandemic um, and it's a five day tour and it's, um, it's a tour I created and I must be biased. Um, it's a very nice tour. Um, it encompasses all areas of natural history, ranging from birds, botany, dragonflies and damselflies butterflies and of course it's mammals as well and the title of this tour is called Cornwall uh, oh, I can't remember now <laughs> beavers chuffs and cetaceans there we go I got it out and this is the hotel we stay at so it's just on the outskirts of Falmouth so not too far down not all the way down to Penzance thank goodness um, and this is the hotel a very nice hotel um, a free star and this is just the uh, type of bedroom so you can just have a look there a very nice nice hotel Okay, so as I said, it's a five day tour. So the first evening you get there, you meet and greet, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then day two, you head down to the Lizard uh, to walk a beautiful coastal path. Uh, so there is some level of fitness required for this tour, but nothing too strenuous um, ever occurs on this tour. But we head down to the, to the Lizard, not only for its um, beautiful display of wildflowers, but also to see uh, the chuff. Uh, so that's one on the checklist of the tour title of this tour. Uh, so the red billed chuff um, is doing very well on Cornish headlands, especially on the lizard, which is where they were initially introduced. Um, so you can get uh, wonderful views such as this and very close views as well, which uh, this picture portraits. This is a photo from one of our tour leaders, Martin Batt, uh, taken in uh, 2021. And as you can see, it has its rings there. So if this bird happened to turn up in Dorset, for example, they would know exactly where it came from. And that is the general idea of this reintroduction to try and get them to spread um, along the English coastline. OK, on the uh, third day of this tour, we do have a very special experience um, and heading to a rewarding destination called Windmill Hill, I believe. Um, and I'm not sure if you um, observed or watched uh, Spring Watch back in 2021, but this site was actually, uh, I mean, it was on the program so you you can have a very good insight to it or maybe get it on bbc iplayer but it may have gone back by then anyway this is the site that we go for uh, to try and find the beaver by no means guaranteed if you look at the foliage on either side of this small lake um, they can be very tricky indeed however we have had 100 percent success rate on finding uh, the beaver on this tour it's around four or five times now and it's due to run again uh, this july and there we go, you can get views such as this. So this was taken by our tour leader last year. I'd say the views can be absolutely wonderful of the, of the Eurasian beaver. And last year, on last year's tour, they were also very lucky to witness the, uh, the release of, of many water voles. Uh, so if you join our tour this year, you may be lucky to see a water vole as well. Now our tour leader this year, he's very keen on his moths. Uh, so if you have a keen interest in moths, then you're especially gonna like this one. Um, the hotel allows us to, have, to run a moth trap each evening. Um, so if you want to get up early and join the tour leader, then by all means, please do. And you can see such goodies as this popular hawk moth. However, one of the main attractions on this tour is a little venture out into the English Channel. Uh, so as I said, we were based near Falmouth and we actually depart out to sea from Falmouth, which is great news. So again, not really much long driving um, on this tour. So this chart, it just displays um, the typical species one can encounter on one of our our excursions, which usually last around five or six hours. And this year we're scheduled to have a brand new catamaran, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and the skipper is equally excited, uh, trust me. Um, and so we're hopeful to get out uh, 
much further to observe the number of species that one can see in Cornish waters. So if we're just looking at the chart there, uh, the short-beaked common dolphin is by far the commonest one can expect to see, and harpal porpoise as well, and do very well down here too. But currently, as I speak, um, there are there is a fin and humpback whale in Cornish waters, uh, not quite this far east. However, they are around and you may be lucky uh, to see one of the great whales as well. Who knows? Um, but it's very exciting being out at sea there. Of course, it's not just the cetaceans we're there for, it's the seabirds as well. A whole variety of shearwaters. You could see up to five species on a single boat trip. So that's great koi, bluric, manx, and maybe something else as well. I've forgotten. But um, and storm petrels as well. Um, maybe the odd puffin, quite rare. But peregrine falcon, razorbill, and guillemots. You get the idea. Um, it really is a fantastic addition to this tour. Now, Great Northern Diver, this was actually seen on last year's tour. This is a non-breeding bird, so it basically couldn't be bothered to fly all the way up north to breed, so it stayed in the Cornish waters where there's plenty of food um, and stayed the entire summer and seen by our group last year. And as I said, short beak common dolphins, they're very common down here and they are the most common cetacean in Cornish waters. You may have more appearances of harbour porpoise, but of course they're always in these smaller pods. Now, in our tour, on our tour in 2021, we were very lucky to see a pod of Risso's dolphins um, on this pelagic, on this boat trip. Um, and the group were very lucky, in fact, to have the, uh, the dolphin's tail slap right in front of us. So um, that really was a spectacle, and it lasted around 15 or 20 minutes. So what's great about this is that we can actually contribute to science as well. So each photo of a dolphin, especially a Risso's dolphin, which aren't that regular in UK waters, can be sent off to a database and each individual could possibly be identified. So you could be, be adding to science um, on this holiday, which is absolutely fantastic, of course. Now, our final full day um, on this trip is pretty much just a cleanup, really, to try and target the species that we've not seen and maybe try and and increase our chances of finding a different array of wildlife. And in this instance, that's the Odonata of the trip. Um, there's a very good reserve, again, not too far away from Falmouth, uh, where we have the chance of seeing a red vein data, for example. So this is actually a scarce visitor to the UK, but with the warming, et cetera, and, and the distribution um, expanding, uh, red vein tartars are now quite a regular breeder along the southern counties, and Cornwall is no exception. And last but not least, the uh, golden ring dragonfly as well, a spectacular, large, robust dragonfly. And that's always a firm favourite for any Odonata enthusiasts on a trip. And this was taken by a client, Roger Pritchard, in 2021. So there we go. That's it for me, folks. If you do wish to join the Cornish tour, those are the dates for you and the price. But as I said, that's all for me. Thank you very much. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A and I will happily answer at the end of the evening. That's great. Thanks once again. And I will pass you over to Neil. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So I'm just going to get hopefully get our, I hope everybody can hear me okay. There we go. Okay, very good evening. Uh, I'm the last one of the presenters uh, this evening. So um, there'll be a little bit of repetition with some of the fantastic images I've seen so far. Uh, my job this evening is to talk to you about the, the Ardamurkan Peninsula. Um, so I think we've seen quite a bit of concentration in the southern half of the UK so far this evening. Um, I loved sort of Tom's uh, point on the uh, some of the cetaceans, and I should be touching on some of that as well. But the Ardnamurkin Peninsula is up in the northwest of Scotland. Um, so basically get to Glasgow and then go up a bit and off to the left. So it's, uh, it's a lovely area which um, in the last few years has been a particular favourite for the nature trekkers. And uh, we probably run more sort of eight day tours up there than anywhere else in the UK and probably in fact anywhere else in Europe. And they've proved to be very popular uh, pre and post pandemic. 
So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Um, <clears throat> what we do generally uh, on these tours, which run through roughly from May through to about October, um, is that we tend to meet up with everybody at Glasgow and then we have a drive out and this is down to your tour leaders to do to drive you out uh, out of Glasgow through some of the most prettiest and amazing landscapes in Scotland really so you're going to go past places like Loch Lomond, uh, Rannoch Moor and then this picture shows shows Glencoe and then I have to, to Loch Lynn and uh, onto Strontian before we actually hit the Ardamurkan Peninsula itself. So straight away into some really fabulous countryside. And uh, if you're like me, then although I do love wildernesses and we don't have those anymore in the UK, I think the Ardamirk and the Northwest Scotland really typifies the closest we can actually see to some really wild habitat. So we drive out to uh, Glen Borrowdale and this is Glen Borrowdale Castle, which hopefully you can see. And we don't actually stay in the castle, sadly. Uh, we're just around the corner in a place called a bunkhouse, which doesn't sound very, very amazing. But in actual fact, it's a very comfortable uh, setup with ensuite rooms. And we actually have uh, caterers coming in to, to look after us during the course of our tour. Anything we can do possibly to spend as much time out looking for the wonderful wildlife in this area, rather than actually uh, making and producing our food ourselves. So halfway on the peninsula, Glen Borrowdale is an ideal spot. And uh, from here, we strike out and look at some of the amazing landscapes. Um, of course, Northwest Scotland can get a quite a bit of rain. And sometimes it's quite challenging with the weather, but we do get some amazing days like this. And this, is, this typifies uh, the scene there uh, during sort of late spring and early summer and into early autumn. Uh, this is Loch Sunart, which is a big sea loch. Um, wonderful place which actually has its own um, its own chemistry of wildlife. You don't even need to go out of Loch Sunart to see an awful lot of sea life. Uh, we're actually in Lager Bay here looking down onto, onto the shore and a little boat down there on the right hand side is one of the boats we often use to cruise out onto the locks uh, to see some of the specialities close up. So we're up in northwest Scotland so what does this show us? Well it shows us a little bit of um, a temperate rainforest that in actual fact can be found in this part of the world. So some of it is, is over in Ireland and then the rest of it pretty much is sort of moving up through North Wales uh, and up into the northwest of Scotland, which is a stronghold of, a, of the, uh, the Sunart rainforest, this area is called. And perhaps the best examples um, is Ariundel Wood, um, uh, uh, which we, we visit on most of the tours. As you can probably see, even in this in this picture, which is before the uh, the proper burst of oak leaves are coming out, you can see there's an awful lot of lichens, bryophytes, um, all living on top of each other. And even though it may not be warm and humid, it is very much a rainforest. So anybody who loves greenery and loves things hanging off each other, absolutely lovely place to visit. And of course, in the spring and early summer, uh, lots of singing wild birds in those woods as well. Okay, so what's the Ardamurkan all about? How did it get its name, etc.? Well, um, people always think of Land's End in Cornwall as being the, the furthest point of the mainland. But in reality, if you look at your map, uh, you'll see that the Ardamurkan point actually stretches further west than, than even Land's End. So it's, it's the, if you like, the furthest point of the, uh, the western mainland of the UK. And it's typified by the lighthouse that sticks on the end. And uh, as in all lighthouses in the UK now, it's, it's automated. And we do make a point of going here because it's a great place to look out over to the Hebridean Sea and looking at the small isles and all the other islands that are dotted out in front of us, as well as a place to looking for seabirds and any moving uh, sea mammals. Should also add also that we normally find time to have a tour of the lighthouse, which is a really good tour of a very enthusiastic uh, guy there that takes us around and shows a little bit about it. Okay, the Monarch of the Glen then. So yeah, we've seen some red deer already on the previous presentations. Um, we've got a lot of red deer in this part of the world. Um, this is a particularly large animal, this individual, 16 pointer stag. Um, and yes, there are large numbers of red deer on the moors here. Uh, we don't have any problems seeing red deer. They're the easiest of the deer to see. And most of the tours actually make a point of looking for the, these large animals. Uh, in the autumn, the, uh, some of the tours are actually associated with the deer rut itself. So slightly shorter tours, about five days long, uh, where we're concentrating around looking at the, the red deer rutting at that time of the year. Uh, the deer share the hills and the moors with, um, with, with the sheep, little tiny dots these are. Um, 
where I'm living in Northamptonshire at the moment, the first, the first sort of spring lambs are, are bouncing around already. But up here in Scotland, the, the lambs don't get going until much later on. So you'd be here in May and see little tiny dots like these. Um, so yeah, so a lot of hill farming going on up here as well. Uh, and these, these sheep and lambs um, are not in conflict with the deer in any way, shape or form. If you like being out in the countryside, just occasionally you see a really rare sight. Um, these aren't particularly rare. But for me, a couple of years ago, we were up on the Isle de Merck and walked out from our accommodation down to Loch Sunat, down to the infamous Aperitif Point to try and find otters. And we came across this group of long-tailed tits, which had just emerged out of the nest. And if people don't know, long-tailed tits in the first hour of fledging all line up with their bums and their, and their, and their faces all sticking out in different directions. And for me, this was the high point of the tour, actually witnessing and we saw it twice on uh, in two different tours about two years ago. So, sorry, just a little little thing from me which I really enjoyed. So, while we're on these tours, particularly the spring tours, what we endeavour to do is take a couple of boat trips out, and we go beyond Loch Sunart, and if we can, we'll pop round to um, some lovely islands nearby. Uh, what, some of the, the islands we visit are the Treshnish Islands, which are particularly good for seabirds. But you've got to visit Staffa, this wonderful wonderful island with the basalt columns, uh, wonderful scenery, uh, quite unique in, in many respects for Scotland. Um, the same sort of structures you'll see in Iceland and also uh, Giant's Causeway uh, across the way. Um, you might just better pick out the people walking down the side here to get an idea of the size relationship. But um, every year I've done this tour, we've always managed to land on Staffa, get an opportunity of walking around to Fingal's Cave and then walking up on top of the island and then we move on for a 20 minute boat ride over to over to the the Trashley Isles and particularly Longa which is the really good seabird station. Wherever we are on this on this tour on the Isle of Merkin Peninsula we're never far from the sea and so we get birds like rock pipits which are always sharing the habitat with us. Fabulous little birds, tough little uh, little things always live on the seashore and give us good views. And of course, you can't ignore the puffins. And up in this part of the world, the puffins are still in reasonable numbers, don't seem to be suffering from some of the, uh, the crashes we've seen elsewhere. What can be better than a load of puffins sitting on some thrift? Um, and they call them the, the clown of the seas. I think they're really amazing. I suppose it's the eyes that, that call them the clown, but we do get very, very close to puffins on longer, almost touching distance. Um, can be a bit of an issue getting onto longer uh, with some slippery rocks, but uh, our boat operators are very skilled and we've never had an accident and uh, people are just thrilled to get really close to these wonderful birds. And other birds exist on, on longer and on these other islands include things like razorbills, uh, which I think are just as good looking as puffins with that mustard yellow gape. And you get the big bruisers out there as well, the great skewers or the bonxes don't breed in large numbers and sadly one of the birds that's been uh, very very adversely affected by uh, bird flu during 2022 but I'm quite sure these birds will bounce back and I'm sure that future trips out to the Isle of Merkin and to the islands out here uh, will will come across these these big brown skewers. Okay Tom in particular mentioned um, cetaceans uh, Matt was talking about them as well um, for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be a bird watcher, but I'm afraid uh, when the cetaceans are around, the birds get ignored. So um, we are quite fortunate on some of these tours to, to come across some wonderful cetaceans. Uh, for me, uh, bottlenose uh, dolphin is always a, is always a, is, is always a, a great pull, which is what this animal is. Tend to be fairly sure hugging, so they keep close in around the locks uh, and also around the headlands. Don't tend to be far out into the pelagic areas. Which is where the common dolphins tend to be. Don't see them on every tour, uh, but they are in some numbers. And like most in Western areas of, of, uh, of the UK, uh, there are dolphins. Um, we're quite fortunate at our accommodation at Glen Borrowdale, um, in as much that we can visit there any time of day, particularly if the weather's not particularly nice, uh, because we have bird feeding station there. We have a mammal feeding station there as well. So even if the weather's fairly miserable, we can always return back to our to our digs and watch siskins and tits and woodpeckers uh, coming onto the bird feeders. And if we're lucky, a whole array of mammals too. In this part of the world, um, I would suggest to you that the, in, the insect population is still relatively healthy. So it's worth the while for the swallows to migrate that little bit further and come all the way up to Northwest Scotland for plenty of insects. 
And of course, there's lots of those lovely midges as well, particularly if you come in June and July. And I know you all love those just as much as I do. But anyway, the swallows, I'm sure, do benefit from the, this mass of midges. But generally speaking, the insectivorous birds do very well and they're not suffering the same way that we find birds perhaps in the southeast of, of Britain doing so. However, I think most people come to the Isle of the Merkin to see the mammals. And what can be more iconic um, to this part of the world than the wonderful pine martin? Certainly one of my favourite animals. I do love the mustelid family. And I think this is probably about the best of the, of the lot, really. You could argue uh, whether a pine martin or an otter is better, but a pine martin, wonderful, sinewy, in, um, nosy, um, just a heck of a character with that glint in the eye, very, very mischievous glint in the eye. And we're quite lazy here on the Arda Merck and we, we don't actually go out looking very hard for pine martins out in the woods. We cheat and we feed them outside the, the bunkhouse and they come and see us most evenings. And sometimes we get lovely views like this. Um, Matt just showed a lovely shot of a golden ring dragonfly. Well, because we've got the acidic sort of areas up in this part of Scotland, then again, golden ring dragonfly is a, a difficult uh, creature to see up there because um, the flight periods are very, very short. But we do come across quite a lot of insects, uh, including the great pied hoverfly, which is the biggest uh, hoverfly in the UK. Uh, you can see it feeding on um, uh, devil's bit scabious, which is a very important flower in this part of the world. Um, and in the right, on the right tours, particularly in the summer tours, we do see, see an array of insects. It does require sunshine, of course, but we do know where to go to find some of the, uh, the lovely butterflies. This one's a small copper, and this, this is a more of a sort of a regional specialist, which is a Scotch Argus. So some similarity with the browns we're perhaps more familiar with uh, down south, but Scotch Argus is a late flying, very dark butterfly. And perhaps the one that most people want to see uh, because in this particular area of Scotland, there are quite a number of sites of the, the Chequers Skipper. And Ariundel Woods is one of the places we actually go to, but we have actually found them in a, a small oak woodland very close to our accommodation. So with a little bit of effort, we should see, in the right time of year, we should see uh, Chequers Skippers on some of the, the summer tours. Grayling, we've already seen a picture, I think from Sue, uh, from a grayling and they, they tend to be quite coastal in this part of the world so and again warm sunshine required but we can see these as well so perhaps you don't always think of Scotland as being a place you would go for insects but in this part of the world um, it's mild up there it's very rarely cold very little in the way of frosts and indeed all the way through the, uh, the, the, the spring to the autumn although it can be wet it's very rarely cold so insects actually and cope very well. And this is a dark green fertility on a Budlia. Okay, a sort of few of the big beasts. This isn't a wild animal, of course, and these days you see Highland, Highland coos all over the place, or Heeland coos, as they say up there. Um, but nevertheless, we do come across these animals um, pretty much all over the place on the Isle of Merkin. They do a very good job of actually eating some of the tougher sward around the coastal areas. Okay, so I mentioned Pine Martin. I suppose this is the other one everybody wants to see. Yes, you can go to Mall, you can go to the Shetland Isles, there's lots of places now where you can see otters. Bit of a success story in the last decade or so, or so around the UK, but probably Loch Sunart has a greater concentration of otters than anywhere else in the UK, basically one per mile. Doesn't always make it easy to find one, but just occasionally you do get some really nice close views. I mentioned Aperitif Point, this is a pet name for a little location just down from Glenborrowdale where we, we tend to walk out in the mornings and these are the views that we have obtained in the past couple of years so plenty of otters there just need to just need to find them and get get a good view marvellous creatures yes he's there again the pine martin and again this is a shot that, uh, I took just through the window of, um, <clears throat> of our accommodation so it just gives you the idea of how close you can be um, the last year or so we've actually had pine martins on the window sills uh, running up and down uh, and we've been some other tall leaders have actually had them coming inside the the open door um, so it just gives you an indication of how brazen they are they know the food's there they're not worried about us they're more worried about other pine martins and foxes but they come in for the food very easily uh, the whole area is a, is a beautiful uh, almost mystical place uh, very few people visit there very few uh, tourists 
the few people that do visit the Outer Merkin Peninsula tend to be the eco-tourists uh, or into history. Uh, this is Swaddle Bay, uh, which had a magnificent find of a, of a buried uh, Viking longboat a number of years ago. And further work has, has, has shown that there is Viking burial sites all around this bay and was probably one of the first places in northwest Scotland where Vikings came into and a great place for things like white-tailed eagles and otters and twite and used to be corn crakes as well so just another little sort of backwater but our accommodation uh, we get red deer coming in trying to pinch the pine martin food sometimes we don't drive them away if they want to come on the on the grass lawn outside uh, we'll happily go out to them and for the first time this year for me or sorry last year for me I was actually mugged by a, a red deer that pinched the peanuts while I still had them in the bowl um, so that wasn't quite according to plan but I do have witnesses to that. A um, few oddities up there it seems these days you can't go around the UK without seeing introduced species and this is a Pierre, de, de, Pierre David deer stag so this is a, an animal that um, originates from, from China. And when the, uh, the species went extinct in the wild, the Pierre David deer were, ones in captivity were distributed all over the world uh, to try and um, improve their breeding success, which has been achieved now. And there is now a wild population uh, back in China. Um, but there are these little, um, little areas of, um, of Pierre de, David deer um, dotted about, and there's a small herd actually at Glen Borrowdale above where we stay. The autumn visits tend to be uh, perhaps more associated with mammals than birds, but of course the fungi come out in force in the autumn as well uh, with the moist uh, environment. And um, I just have to say that you know, on, on a decent day, it's just a marvellous place for, for great views. If you're into volcanoes, into granite, into geology as such, there, it's a fascinating place. And probably the best preserved caldera in the UK um, is actually on a, on a road that goes out to Sana um, on the north coast of the Ardwerka Peninsula. It's not always easy to appreciate uh, as to where you are in the caldera, um, but there's some amazing um, maps and um, models which you can see in the visitor centres there, which give an indication of where you are on this massive volcano. Being next to the sea, uh, other sea animals include uh, common seals. Uh, they're quite common. The grey seals are much scarce for some reason, but the common seals, all the harbour seals, are relatively common. We see get very, very close views of them. Wading birds, including curlews, are still in reasonable numbers there on the small estuaries, and they breed on the moorlands up there. And it is an opportunity to when we go out onto the uh, with the boats onto the onto the sea lock and to encounter things like flocks of goosanders, which is not, not a very common sight for me, I have to say. And then when we go a little bit further out to the mouth of Loch Suna and out onto the Hebridean Sea, uh, perhaps on our way to one of the islands, uh, come across rafts of Manx Shearwaters, uh, which is always a delight to see. And there's a very large colony of Manx Shearwaters which breed on Rom, which is just a few miles away from the Isle of Merkin, so we see them quite regularly on our sea watches. When we're out on a boat, you're never quite sure what you're going to see next, and just occasionally you get a lovely view of a quite a common bird that nonetheless looks very special. And this is an out of breeding plumage, a common guillemot, which I was very pleased to photograph. For me, uh, as I said before, once the cetaceans get into action, I'm afraid that the birds possibly take a, a back seat. There's very few other creatures that do that. Um, there is a healthy population of common dolphins out there and we do, when we do go on our boat trips we do stand a chance of actually seeing these, these wonderful animals. Uh, scenery as I've mentioned before, the history, the geology, it all, it all combines to make this uh, a very interesting place indeed. Uh, this is uh, Kavanagal uh, which is a very interesting little bay. Uh, it would appear now from all some of the, um, some of the digs that have been going on over the last few years um, that there's a whole mass of history associated with this that now possibly uh, puts, puts back uh, when the first humans arrived here. It's now thought that they arrived here usually within years of the Ice Age um, uh, departing these shores, uh, which wasn't actually that very long ago. So lots of, lots of new finds going on here all the time, but this area here was deemed to be one of the first areas of habitation on the peninsula itself. Uh, the big hill over on the Ben Hiant is the biggest hill um, on the Arda Merkin Peninsula, uh, heavily grazed with sheep and deer. Used to be thousands and thousands of rabbits, but sadly they've died out now. 
And in this, this area, you know, we're in Northwest Scotland now, we look for the, we're looking for the big birds of prey, the big exciting ones. Uh, there are golden eagles on the Ardham Ard Merkin Peninsula. Not always easy to see uh, and possibly not breeding anymore uh, due to the lack of mammalian prey. But nevertheless, we see golden eagles on every trip or just about on every trip. But a far easier one to see, of course, now is the, the white-tailed eagle or the white-tailed seagull, if you like. Uh, these birds are doing particularly well in Scotland with the original reintroduction schemes. Um, on every, every trip now, we're seeing white-tailed eagles and all the tour leaders know where some of the nest sites are now as well. Uh, it's a big landscape. We don't always get incredibly close like this to some of these, um, these majestic raptors. But nevertheless, we do get some we do get some long sustained views off with them hunting or chasing each other and often in company with ravens as well. And for me, pine martin, otter, eagles, cetaceans, seabirds, what isn't there to like? Uh, and for me, uh, it's always a bit of a dream to go back to the Arden Merkin. Going to finish with just a, a last picture. Um, just showing, <laughs> if you like, the contrasting weather that we have up on the Arden Merkin. It seems to me that you can look to your left and it's sunshine, look to your right, it's pouring with rain, and in the middle it's doing something different again. But this is just a rainbow and a little bit of sunshine uh, over Loch Sunart. Um, it's a wonderful place to go, and I would say to anybody who's interested in nature, into wildlife, into conservation, make the effort, go to the Arden Merkin Peninsula at least once in your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Neil. I think uh, I think everyone's going to be inspired by that talk and those images there. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you very much for your um, <clears throat> for your questions that have come in so far. Do please keep sending them in. Um, I'll start with uh, you, Neil. Actually, um, a couple there. Um, any wildcat sightings and red squirrels? Bizarrely, can you believe on that side of Scotland, red squirrels are really scarce. Um, there's a couple of spots which, again, the the tour leaders know to look for red squirrels. It seems to me, though, with the increase in rainfall, that uh, red squirrels don't don't do very well in, in heavy rainfall areas. Plus, there are a lot of pine martins in these areas, so those two two factors probably limit the number of red squirrels. But there are a couple of spots where we can see some red squirrels. And on our way down to the, the peninsula, uh, we do actually visit a uh, red squirrel feeding station. And providing the forestry commission guys have actually put some feed in the feeders, we do stand a chance of seeing them. Wild cats, well, I photograph lots of cats at night. We do lots of night drives down there with a view to finding them. And when we first started doing the Arden Merkin tours, I think there was a pretty good chance you could have come across them. I think in reality now, those days have gone. I think any, any cats that we've I photographed over the last two years has been very iffy as to what they've been. The very best they've been hybrids. And uh, I personally have not been satisfied that I've seen a pure Scottish wildcat. There are a few animals on, on the other side of a landmass called Morven, uh, where there is established small community of them there. But in general, on the Arden Merkin, I would say it's not an animal you should expect to see. OK. OK. Thanks for that. Um, Tom. Um, I think we had a question that came in uh, quite early on that um, we responded to privately and not necessarily to the whole group, and that was the success rate uh, of getting over to St Kilda. Yeah, well, I've not actually done the tour myself, but uh, yeah, I had a quick look and it's, you know, the seas are quite rough around there, so it can't be guaranteed, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's probably a 50-50 situation, I'd have thought averaging out across the years yeah. yeah yeah that's that's my understanding as well maybe a little bit higher than 50 yeah. 50 um obviously um the captain's uh decision goes wh whatever he decides and obviously everyone's safety is paramount um but if we if it's not possible to make it over then we stick to the uh stick around the the mainland and the the hebrides um and people still have a, a great time obviously yeah, of course. They would yeah. like to make it out. To yeah, Sakura, I but... mean, if you're going to get there, it's going to be on that boat, isn't it? I don't think any of the other 
craft that go over there will have any better chance. So, yeah. it, you know, it's as good as an opportunity as any really to get there, I think. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned, actually, you and Matt, I think you both mentioned uh, in your talks about um, a photograph of, of dolphins uh, and being able to identify their fins or, you know, identify particular individuals yeah. by their fins. You both mentioned that, you know, they could be sent somewhere. Um, you know, where what organisation is it well, that they could uh, be sent to? Yeah, I mean, I should have said, really, that uh, Nature Trek does allow myself to record on the on the trip. So we are collecting scientific data and we have uh, a large photo ID catalogue. And we also have a website where you can upload uh upload images as well so but yeah but in the southwest i think any dolphin sightings pictures of fins could be sent there because we've got catalogues for bottlenosed and white beat dolphins and uh contribute to rissos as well so check out the marine life website okay brilliant yeah. thank you um and uh there's also a question yeah i'm gonna um <laughs> test your your knowledge uh memory a little bit of your presentation um or there was a slide where the with a bird with red feet on yeah. when you're talking yeah that'll be the it depends where you live it'll be the black guillemot in dorset but it'll be the tasty in scotland okay so, yeah that's right dust bit well they, they're not uh washing up bowl orange washing up bowls aren't orange now but uh from from a certain generation it's washing up bowl <laughs> leg colour. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Well done, Matt. Correct ID there. <laughs> um okay, Sue, some questions for you for me. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um first of all, uh how how large is the uh Fenraf spider? Ah, well, um, it is Britain's largest spider. It's also amongst our rarest as well. And a good old female will be about two and a half to three inches. They are big. They do feed on fish, um, albeit small sticklebacks and minnows. Um, and they actually have the most amazing hunting. Uh, they don't build webs like most spiders do but they sit with their with their front feet with their front paws actually on the water and they feel vibrations through the water and then will will run out and, and catch things and they also live the females can live sort of 18 months to two years as well so a, a yeah a, a sort of two-year-old female can be can be three inches right okay right yeah they're quite i mean as far as spiders go it's quite, quite they are quite big person. They're yeah. also they're That's beautifully cool. velvety furry, and because they're on water and you're looking down on them, you're not liable to come across one face to face, so you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you also um, got to test your knowledge of your slides. Um, you showed a blue damselfly. What was the the, uh, the, the damsel the location? The Please. damselflies, um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, uh, it had two uh, pictures. Um, it's actually emerald damselflies. And the common emerald damselfly is common across much of Britain. Um, but the scarce emerald is very much a sort of Thetford Forest, Breckland speciality. And Thompson Common is one of the best places to see them. And we could potentially have both next to each other there. Wow. Great. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, so you, you mentioned that you um, you do day trips in that area. Um, I think obviously we all do, you all do day trips uh, in the UK, but specifically you mentioned the ones that you do in June focusing on uh, the orchids there. Do you do uh, any others? Yes. So the Valley Fen ones in June focus on the orchids mainly. Uh, we then go back again uh, in August, which was uh, for the Fenraf spider particularly, but also for Grasa Parnassus, uh, which is just a stunning flower and has to be seen to be believed. And I also run uh, winter, well, autumn uh, day trips in, in the same area for fungi, do fungi forays in usually October. Mm, yeah, good. I know those are, those are popular, aren't they? They have been really popular, yeah. Yeah. 
brilliant stuff. Great. Uh, Matt, question for you. You may have already seen it come in. Um, how do you explain why there are uh, <laughs> why there's so many starlings and huge numbers in the levels in wintertime? Why there? Yep. So it's mainly due to the fact that there's a vast expanse of rebed. And I know you're probably thinking, well, there's vast expanses of rebeds all over the UK in, in particular areas. Um, so the Somerset levels, um, I'm not sure why they choose there. Does anyone know why they choose there? But the reason why there's such a contrast um, between uh, the summer and winter, so the starling is actually a migratory species, um, not of of course, not all migrate over to Scandinavia, but those that do, they return in the autumn or the early winter, and obviously some will make it down to the Somerset level. So uh, the roost um, on in Somerset has been passed down by generations um, over uh, decades um, in some instances. So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why they choose there but they do choose there there's obviously a very good reason why they choose there uh, <laughs> because there's so many of them um but yep yeah, the winter's the best time to see it you won't see it um in the spring summer or autumn okay great thank you very much um right i i think i'm i mean i'm i'm out of questions um so uh, I think we will wrap this evening up. Uh, so thank you ever so much to all of you for joining us. I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, and thank you to uh, the panellists for your time and expertise. Um, very much appreciated. Um, there will be a recording of this, should you like to watch it again, uh, on our website. Um, I think you might also receive an email with it as well. Um, certainly if you if you weren't able to join us or only halfway through you should receive an email with a recording as well so um anyway thank you very much uh, i hope you all have a good evening and please do join us for the next one um we have just announced uh, a new raft of uh, evenings um so look out for those on our website um, and uh, also in your inbox uh, with an email from us okay well once again thank you and uh, have a good, Thank you. good evening. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers, everybody.